Okay, welcome to Second Sunday for July 2023. I'm Paul Lover, a volunteer with the Friends of Great Swamp. Our Second Sunday programs are made possible by the Friends of Great Swamp and by the generous support of the Marta Heflin Foundation. Today, we are excited to welcome Chris Alice Kratzer and her presentation, Wasps, the Misunderstood Insect. A mechanical engineer and graduate of Rochester Institute of Technology, Chris is the founder of Owlfly Engineering and Owlfly Publishing. Owlfly Engineering develops sustainable technologies related to climate change mitigation, both locally and globally. In addition, Chris is an entomologist and is the author of the award-winning field guide, The Social Wasp of North America. Published in 2022, this book covers 208 wasp species from the high Arctic of Alaska all the way down to Panama. Similar to artist and naturalist Roger Tory Peterson, Chris has not only written and published a major field guide while still in her 20s, she has also included hundreds of her own exquisite illustrations in this groundbreaking and comprehensive book. So please join me. Let's welcome author, entrepreneur, and entomologist, Chris Alice Kratzer. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's very flattering. I think. Okay. Um, actually, if we could bring up the presentation now, that would be perfect. Um, yeah, so just hold a second while we bring this up. All right. Whoops. Is every this is the front. Yeah. This one. Yeah. <laughs> sure. See. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me this afternoon to talk about wasps, what they are and what they do. Um, as um, <coughs> Paul said just a few minutes ago, um, but, uh, I want to ask you to please save all questions for the end of the presentation. Oops. So my name is Chris Ellis Kratzer, but I like to go by Allie. Um, I am an insect scientist and award-winning author of the book, The Social Wasp of North America, which was released last year and established me as one of the youngest published field guide authors in history. I've spent the last five years now uh, researching and writing about social wasps, which are the ones that build big paper nests that many of you are probably very familiar with. Um, in the context of insects, social means that the wasps cooperate to take care of each other's young. This group is almost solely responsible for the bad reputation that wasps have and includes all of the yellow jackets, hornets, and paper wasps that, statistically speaking, have probably bothered you at some point in your life. This book is the first of its kind and includes over 900 of my own full color illustrations, which begs the question, why on earth would someone go so far out of their way to write a book about wasps? Everyone knows that wasps are just the hateful cousins of bees that don't serve any purpose other than making our lives more difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that always struck me as odd, and it made me curious. Are wasps the vile creatures that people make them out to be? Or is there more to this story than meets the eye? Today, I hope to give you a glimpse into the hidden world of complexity and diversity right outside of your doorsteps, and show how it connects to our ecosystems and to our daily lives. Then you can come to your own conclusions. First, some background. All wasps have three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings. Their wings fold apart at rest, but in flight, their hind wings latch onto their fore wings with a row of teeny tiny little hooks like Velcro. Uh, to create a single, larger, flexible wing, um, which makes them very quick and agile flyers. All wasps have mandibles on the sides of their mouths. They also have little claws at the end of their feet. Some wasps even have paw pads that they can use to walk on walls like geckos. Most wasps also have a thin waist in the middle of their body, which acts like a hinge to make their whole bodies more flexible. There are hundreds of thousands, and it's supposed to be black, don't worry. There are hundreds of thousands of different types of wasps. 
they are incredibly diverse. Wasps come in almost any color and shape that you can imagine. Um, and they all play different roles in nature. For example, sawflies are simple plant eaters with babies that are easily mistaken for the caterpillars of moths and butterflies. Spider wasps hunt spiders to feed their babies. Tool wasps are like little pirates. They raid the nests of other wasps for food. Gall wasps sting plants to trick them into building protective little houses for their babies. Some wasps make nests out of mud and others make nests out of paper. Some wasp babies are parasites within other bugs. Parasitic wasps parasitize only one or two other types of insects and almost every other insect in the world has an associated wasp parasite. And that's just scratching the surface of wasps that live right here in New Jersey. Whoops, those are the parasites. <laughs> so wasps are a huge group. Even bees and ants, often depicted as unrelated insects, are both just specialized types of wasps. But I don't say that to alarm you. Though we are surrounded by wasps in our daily lives, most wasps cannot sting. Stinging wasps, excuse me. Stinging wasps have an organ near their butt, which is called the stinger. Only female wasps can sting. The males, though almost identical to the females in appearance and number, lack the ability to eject venom. The ability to sting evolved only once. All of the stinging wasps of today are descended from that one common ancestor. The ability to sting evolved a long time after the first wasps, which is part of the reason there are so many more of them that don't. And just to avoid confusion, um, the ancestor of all ants and bees could sting, but most ants have since lost that ability. It's kind of like how wasps are, excuse me, it's kind of like how whales are like technically mammals, even though they don't look or act very much like the rest of the group. Same with wasps and ants. So out of all of the wasps that we discussed earlier, only a handful of these groups can actually sting. But many of the ones that can sting can really pack a punch. So let's talk about those. There are a few really important things to remember to reduce your risk of getting stung. <laughs> I've been stung a single time since I started studying wasps up close years ago, so I know these tips work. Still, wasps are wild animals and these tips are not magic, so interact with wasps at your own risk. If you find yourself next to a wasp nest, stay calm, breathe slowly, and move slowly. Wasps are attuned to sense rapid movements and carbon dioxide, so if you minimize these, you minimize your risk. Again, stay calm, breathe slowly, and move slowly. If you disturb a nest, or if you are stung near a nest, stay calm, move quickly away from the nest, and alert others. Try to avoid flailing your arms. Erratic movements will increase the likelihood that you are stung additional times. Make sure to alert other people in the area of the danger so that no one else is hurt. Again, stay calm, move quickly, and alert others. Uh, wasps only usually try to sting people when defending their nests or if they are physically harassed, such as being squeezed or swatted. Foraging wasps are rarely aggressive. A single wasp typically won't try to hurt you on purpose, typically. Um, to avoid accidental stings, you should wear closed-toed shoes while outdoors. Now, unfortunately, wasps don't understand things like outdoor markets and picnics. The smell, they smell the food and fly in to eat it, and then they get frightened by the big animals, humans trying to hurt them. The best way to prevent wasps from panicking is to avoid attracting them to begin with. Many species of social wasps are attracted to meat, rotting fruit, and sugary fluids, such as sauces, juices, and soft drinks. When outdoors, make sure to properly cover food and drinks, 
and dispose of waste in the appropriate covered bin or container so that the wasps won't be able to smell the food from as far away. Now, because it is my area of study, let's take a look at the, social, the life cycle of just social wasps. As a quick note, when I say social wasps here, I am excluding bees and ants. However, many of the facts presented here apply to all three subgroups. We start with the founding of a new nest. In temperate climates, this is done in the spring by a single queen. The queen lays an egg in each cell of her nest and nurtures her young larvae as they grow. These larvae will pupate and emerge as workers, which will take over the roles of upkeep and foraging to allow the queen to devote more time to laying eggs. For most of the year, all of the wasps within a given nest will be the direct children of the foundress, the foundress queen. Towards the end of the season, the queen and the workers will begin laying eggs to produce the next generation of queens and males. Queen wasps can produce more queens, males, and workers, but workers, since they cannot be fertilized, can only produce males. Mm. However, in some species, workers can also become queens later in life. The queens and males mate in the fall. Only the queens hibernate through the winter in rotten logs or loose soil. The rest of the colony dies at the onset of winter. Oops. Well, there's the whole thing. <laughs> now let's take a look at how wasps fit into the food web. Again, I will focus in on just social wasps for the purposes of this presentation. At the bottom of the food chain, we have crops and native plants, which are eaten by bugs that we usually think of as pests, like grasshoppers, beetles, caterpillars, and flies. Social wasps are so important because they are not picky eaters. They hunt all of these different pe uh, plant pests and, in doing so, help to protect the plants that we rely on. They are especially good predators of harmful caterpillars. Social wasps, in turn, are hunted by a wide variety of larger animals. They are an important food source for many songbirds and lizards. Perhaps more surprisingly, however, uh, is their importance to mammals that hibernate. Baby wasps, which are protected within a wasp nest, are a vital food source for bears, skunks, raccoons, opossums, and coyotes, especially these mammals eagerly brave hundreds of angry wasps to feast on their young in order to store up on fat and protein for the long winter ahead. Oops. Uh, large mammals are a big threat to wasp nests, so social wasps have evolved defensive behaviors that specifically target large mammals. Unfortunately, <laughs> we are large mammals. <laughs> So that's why they cause us so many problems. They evolved to defend their young from predators that to them look just like us. So to recap, let's look at an example of how wasps affect the broader ecosystem. When wasp populations plummet, pest populations surge. Too many pests can stress or kill their host plants, which isn't good for anybody. Conversely, when wasp populations are healthy, pest populations are kept in check, and the plants they feed on are able to thrive. Because of the sheer number of insects wasps catch and eat, uh, wasps, this time including ants, um, are the most important predators in all terrestrial ecosystems. Now, all of this is not to say that caterpillars are categorically bad, of course, Caterpillars and other plant pests are good for the environment in moderation. They help regulate plant growth and habitat in ways that benefit the entire ecosystem. The important takeaway here is that everything in nature exists in a balance and that wasps are critical to maintaining that balance. Now let's talk about pollination. Again, because it is my area of study, let's focus in on just the social wasps. Social wasps are abundant. They visit many flowers to drink nectar, which makes them important pollinators. The fuzzier wasps tend to be more efficient pollinators than the smoother ones. 
because pollen sticks to them better, but they are all essential. Many native flowers in North America evolved specifically for social wasp pollination, including asters, golden rods, many cacti, mints, jewelweed, and milkweed. In temperate regions, many of those plants timed the emergence of their flowers with the peak of wasp colony development in the fall, although some coordinate their flowering with the emergence of new queens in the spring. In North America, social wasps are also important pollinators of numerous food crops, such as carrots, parsnips, celery, and sunflowers, as well as many spices, such as oregano, basil, peppermint, spearmint, lavender, fennel, dill, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. <laughs> That's true. Um, the wasps pollinate. Could somebody turn off your mic? Uh, it's picking up on the feed. <laughs> All right, let's see. So now I would like to walk you through the top 10 most common social wasps in New Jersey to give you some familiarity with the wasps in our area. If these illustrations look familiar, it's because I have shamelessly stolen them from my book. So without further ado, let's dive on in. Whoops, well, that's a weird formatting error. That's supposed to say 10. Um, number 10 is the common aerial yellow jacket. So named because it typically constructs paper nests high in tree branches. It is common in forest habitat throughout the US and Canada. Number nine is the German yellow jacket, an invasive species from Europe. It was accidentally introduced to Montreal in the 1960s, probably via a nest in a shipping container. And its range has expanded substantially since then, especially over the last 20 years. The German yellow jacket is now found on every continent except Antarctica. <clears throat> Number eight is the red coat paper wasp. Paper wasps construct relatively small umbrella shaped paper nests in semi sheltered locations. Number seven is the coral paper wasp, so called because its color pattern resembles that of a coral snake with red touching yellow. The range of this species is expanding northwards due to climate change. It was once only found as far north as South Jersey, but can now be found throughout the state. Number six is the Southern Yellow Jacket. Most yellow jacket nests are annual, which means they only last one year. However, nests south of Tennessee can become perennial when they are used year round by the same family of wasps. The largest perennial yellow jacket nest ever recorded belonged to this species and me measured a staggering nine feet tall. It should be noted that a nest that large is exceedingly rare and annual yellow jacket nests rarely get larger than a pumpkin. Number five is the European paper wasp, another invasive species from Europe. It was accidentally introduced to Massachusetts in the 1970s. It has since become a major pest species and one of the most abundant wasps on the continent. Number four is the Eastern Yellow Jacket. Like many yellow jackets, this species builds paper nests in old abandoned rodent burrows underground. Number three is the European Hornet which is one of the largest wasps on the continent. It is, you guessed it, another invasive species from Europe. It was accidentally introduced to New York in the 1850s, and it is now well established across most of the Eastern US. This species is often attracted to porch lights at night. Number two is the imposter paper wasp, so-called because it mimics so many other species of wasps. This is one of its color forms, but to really get you an appreciation for how variable the species really is, here are a, a few more. <laughs> Remember, this is all one species. All right, let's move on to the number one most common species of social wasp in New Jersey, the bald-faced hornet. These wasps are called hornets because of their large size, but they are technically yellow jackets. 
Like the common aerial yellow jackets, this species builds large paper nests high in trees. The nests are easiest to spot in the winter once the leaves fall, but the wasps are long gone by then. Like all social wasps in New Jersey, only the queens survive the winter. So before we move on to Q&A for today, um, I just wanted to briefly mention that I am hard at work on a field guide to cicadas. So even if wasps still aren't your thing, we here at Owlfly have lots more in store for you in the near future. And regardless of how you feel about bugs, you probably enjoy your home being cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Well, we have good news on that front too. Um, a few weeks ago, the Owlfly team won one of the most prestigious grants in the country, a National Science Foundation Small Business Innovation Research Grant, um, which will enable us to set up a factory to produce a new highly efficient thermal insulation for buildings that I invented by studying the nests of wasps that live above the Arctic Circle. Our insulation is fittingly called Yellow Jacket after the wasps that inspired it. So just to give a really quick uh, overview, Yellow Jacket is American-made, lightweight, water-resistant, non-combustible, non-toxic, non-dusting, irritant-free, and made from recycled materials. Uh, Yellow Jacket prototypes already outperform the thermal properties of most fiberglass. Um, and our team is optimistic that improved photo prototypes will be able to surpass the thermal properties of all other commercial bat insulation on the market at an affordable price. 11% of all energy in the United States is used for heating and cooling, so advances in insulation can have a huge impact on climate change mitigation. If anything could offer proof that the field of entomology is worth studying, even if you're not a biologist, it should be this. <laughs> we have so much more to learn. All right, so thank you so much for joining me today to talk about a very underappreciated topic. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, we now have some time for Q&A, um, after which I'll be able to sign some books. Um, so I turn it over to Paul real quick, and then... Keep it going? Yeah, I think so. I think so, too. Okay. 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 <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll pass that. Okay, we're good. Oh. <laughs> okay, we're good. Um, start it again. Okay, good. <laughs> we're good? Okay. We're good. Okay, Q&A. Yes. Um, Cicada killers, where did, are they social? I thought there's... So they are communal, which is slightly different. So they don't actually cooperate to take care of each other's young. They just nest in the same area in order to try to ward off predators more effectively, which is especially funny in the case of cicada killers because they have barely any sting at all. Like if you ever get stung, it's just like a, just a little pinprick. But... The ones that are huge, right? Oh yeah, they're really big. They look really aggressive. They act really aggressive, but they're they're harmless. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. So if you feel a wasp nest in your house, near your house, or in an eave somewhere in your house, you just wait until they fall and they all disappear. I mean, is that a kind way to, or what, what do you, or everybody wants to get these repellents and, and spray them. And what's, what's, I mean, you, you, it seems to me like just wait and they'll, they'll go away. So the question was, uh, can you wait to, uh, if there's an, a wasp nest in your house, can you wait until winter for the wasps to go away on their own? And the answer is yes, if it's in an area that you don't think you're going to be in a lot, and it's not likely that they're going to get into other parts of your house. So like if you have one in the wall of your attic or something like that, and you're not going to use your attic for a while, you can probably just leave it as is. Um, but if you uh, have concerns about a specific nest, I recommend getting in touch with a pest control specialist, which I am not. <laughs> yes. So you said in the winter, the, the, now I think I'm talking about fall hornet. Mm -hmm. uh, in the winter that there's nothing left there. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, we've seen, um, for the tit mice and so on, like pecking at it and as if they're eating something out of there. Mm -hmm. What might they be eating? So the question was, um, there was an observation of songbirds um, pecking at a, a nest in winter um, that, according to my presentation, should have been abandoned. So the answer to that is that although all of the adults have died, um, there can still be larvae in the nest. So that might be what they're after. Makes sense. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what wasp has like the most powerful like, sting? 
So the question was, which wasp has the most powerful sting? And it's actually a two-way tie. Um, I'm actually just gonna check if there's any, can you check to see if there's any uh, questions online? I will answer that question. I think um, should be checking that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, there is a two-way tie. Um, one of them is uh, the tarantula hawk moth, or tarantula hawk wasp, sorry, um, which lives in Texas and Mexico. Um, and the other one is uh, the northern warrior wasp, which is only found in Central America. Um, a, a wasp scientist um, described it as being tied to a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, very unpleasant. The good thing is that neither of those exists around here. So we're, we're completely safe. <laughs> yes. Um, we've read a lot. I've heard a lot about uh, the pesticide. You're going to pronounce the name. Ne 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 Neonicotinoids. Thank you. Um, <laughs> being applied and having an effect on honeybee populations. So mm -hmm. curious if that if wasps are so important to ecosystem health. Is there data out there about how they're affecting wasp populations also? Yeah, that's another great question. So the question was, uh, do neonicotinoid pesticides also affect wasps in addition to bees? Um, and the answer is yes. There is no such thing as a wasp-specific uh, pesticide. There's no such thing as a, except for very specific by a lot of uh, agricultural circumstances, there's no such thing as a single pest specific pesticide, um, unless they're specifically using biological control, like using a certain type of fungus or a certain type of wasps to help control insect populations. Um, so yes, neonicotinoid pesticides have the same effect on social wasps that they do on bees, unfortunately. So they are causing problems. <laughs> yes. So taking the entire thousands of wasps in the world, what percentage would you say are social and then communal and then the rest are single? Um, <laughs> the, the term we use is solitary. Yeah. So, so the question was out of all the wasps in the world, how many are social, communal, and solitary? And uh, rough, number. rough number, of course. Uh, so currently there are 114,000 known species of wasps. There's probably- 114,000? Yes. Not just here, uh, around the yeah, world, yeah. Um, but uh, there's probably around thirty thousand or three hundred thousand um, total that we just most of them have not been described yet because it's a very understudied field. Um, so there are two hundred and eight social wasps in North America. I don't know how many there are in the world, but you can probably it's two thousand maybe. <laughs> um, so 2,000 out of 114,000 is not a lot. Um, there are probably a few more communal species than there are social ones, but not that many more. Um, so the number that are actually so, uh, social or communal is a very small percentage of the total wasps that are out there. Well, I have a question. Can social wasps or other wasps help us control spider lantern flies? That's a great question. So the question was, can social wasps help us control spotted lanternflies? Um, and the answer is yes. So a lot of several different species of yellow jackets have been observed in the wild, uh, getting a taste for them. So they started out pretty much across the board, avoiding them because it was a new thing in the environment. But uh, they seem to slowly be taking advantage of the huge amount of bugs out there for them to feed on. So and yeah, great is, question. Is it, helpful if, is it invasive species? From Asia, say, would that would that help? Because it's That's a good question. So there are probably parasitoid wasps that specialize on just that species. So it is possible that bringing them over here with the proper precautions mm -hmm. um, could help to limit their populations. Um, there, uh, the invasive yellow jacket, the German yellow jacket that we have around here, is more likely to feed on them than any of the other oh, okay. uh, native species that we have. So. Cool. A small silver lining, I suppose. Yes. So, since well, I'm not good at identifying which wasp is which wasp or the yellow jacket and which, so something about that thing <laughs> has been out here in fall festival. They were eating the lanternflies, carrying them off whole, 
barely <laughs> enough to drag through the air. I got lots of pictures. Oh, so fantastic. Get, get, get so, so the question is for an ID of a wasp that was seen out here. It was as large as, so it was as large as a hornet to me. It looked like some hornet. Okay. Um, was, do you remember what colors it was? Yellow and black. Yellow and black. Okay. It does not narrow it down, but uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, certainly. If if you have pictures, I'd be happy to help identify. But, okay. um, I have a question. You hear the term horny. Mm -hmm. Is that a specific subset of the wasp family, or is that just what does that mean specifically? So, at least to us scientists, a hornet means um, any wasp in the genus Vespa. So it's just one genus within social wasps. So. But they are social. They are social, yes. They make very large nests. <laughs> and a lot of those look like they were Vespa under Vespa. On the... So a lot of them were Vespula, which is slightly different. It's taxonomy is a mess, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Vespula, the taxonomic name, just literally means little hornet. So, yes. So how did Vespa become a scooter? <laughs> because it buzzes a lot. The question was, how did Vespa become a scooter? Um, and I think that that's exactly right. That the, it buzzes along. <laughs> I'm not familiar with the history of motor scooters, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. So before you had a picture of a wasp that had all the different uh, colorations, right? Mm -hmm. How do you? How do you know it's the same wasp? <laughs> That's a great question. So the question was, how do you know that an imposter paper wasp is an imposter paper wasp, but not any of the dozens of other species that look like it? Um, and the question, uh, the answer is, you have to be a little bit crazy in order to figure it out. Um, so a lot of times, what we do in taxonomy, when you're really uh, trying to study the specifics of each species, you look at not just the coloration, but also the morphology is what it's called. So it's the, the structure of their actual bodies. Um, and usually there are very subtle variations, like there's a crease here where there isn't one in the other species, or there's a different texture on part of the abdomen or whatever. And, uh, when you get into what's called cryptic species, which is species that look absolutely identical in the field, um, it gets to be very, very challenging. And it's something that turns a lot of people away from entomology because it's so complicated. Um, but yeah, the, the answer is we look at not just the color, but also everything about the wasp, including its genetics. Yes. Well, how do you ca catch a wasp? How do you catch a wasp? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I typically use a butterfly net um, if I'm out in the field um, and then, you know, very carefully <laughs> let it go afterwards if I need to. Um, there's a lot of uh, passive traps that you can use to collect insects that are just out in the world um, if you want to study a bunch of them at once. Um, for examples are like malaise traps, which is sort of like a, a net structure that like funnels them all into a, a container for future study. Um, if you're talking about I should say, when I'm just out in the field just for fun looking at wasps, um, I don't recommend you try them. I can have them land on my hands. <laughs> it's fine. Um, again, don't recommend that necessarily. Well, when I was in the seventh grade, uh, the, um, we used to go out and collect insects and mm -hmm. pin them to a floor. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was always a little tricky because you have to yell at the floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't use anything to stun them or anything when you're actually looking at them. So normally I can get away with, with my particular line of research, I can just use photographs and usually that's enough. Um, but uh, if, if I am collecting an insect for study in the future, then I will have to kill it. Um, usually I'll just put it on a container and then put it in the freezer for like two days and that'll, that'll kill it. Um, yeah, and I also have to tell my mom when that happens because, <laughs> because there have been times when I have forgotten that step. And uh... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So the question was, can wasps sting multiple times? So yes, most wasps can sting multiple times, at least the ones that can sting. So, yep. 
So a lot of the hornets and yellow jackets and paper wasps, part of the reason that they're such a pain for us, no pun intended, is uh, because they can do those multiple stains. Stains. Question: When they eat a bug, they, mm -hmm. do they go up to dragonflies? I assume that they probably would, or is that too big? Uh, yeah, wasps will eat yeah. dragonflies. So how do they digest it when they have that waste that is almost like yeah, no. <laughs> like a pitch, like a yeah. So the question was, how can wasps eat, like hunt and eat other insects when they have such a little waste in the middle of their bodies? And the answer is they don't. They do not eat them. So when wasps go out and hunt larger insects, at least the ones that I study, um, they will uh, collect up a bunch of fat and protein into a ball fly that back to their nest and feed the mate and protein to their larvae. The larvae do not have those wastes and they can eat solid foods. The adults have to rely on pollen or honeydew from other insects. So honeydew is basically the equivalent of milk for insects. There's, there's a whole bunch of like small bugs that will produce it. So there are actually many species of social wasps that have developed a kind of agriculture um, in uh, they will protect and herd these little tiny insects up and down flower stems, and they will feed on the juices and then produce honeydew and they'll milk them. Uh, and that's another way that they can get food. It's crazy. Is that like the aphids? Yes, aphids do produce honeydew. There's also uh, uh, tree hoppers do that. There's uh, what? Lantern flies do, but wasps don't really domestic, at least the, the native ones don't do anything with them. <laughs> so, uh, you might want to ask Pat if there are any. Questions. Sure, yeah. Uh, are there any questions online? So I can't actually see the message board. Or people can help. Yeah, or you could unmute yourself. I have a question. Oops. Okay, I didn't know if there was me. When did wasps, what was the first, what was the size of the progenitor of the bees, the ants, the wasp, and when did they split? So the question was, uh, what was the size of the common ancestor between bees, ants, and wasps, and when did they split? So um, that is a complicated question um, because uh, bees and ants split off at different times from the main wasp lineage. So um, we don't actually know 100% what size it was because a lot of times insects don't fossilize well. So a lot of the evidence we have for their evolution comes from current phylogenetic analysis, which is basically when we go out and take DNA samples from all these different species um, and try to figure out how they're related and how long ago they could have been the same species. Um, so. The ancestor of bees was probably very small, um, and it probably looked similar to the nomadus genus uh, bees today, which are mostly hairless. They look very much like wasps, um, but they do, of course, have those pollen baskets on their hind legs, which distinguishes them as bees, um, and they are herbivorous, and as opposed to many species of wasps. Um, the ants probably looked very similar to modern ants, um, just with more wings for more of the time. Um, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head when these two lineages diverged, um, but yeah, <laughs> there are papers about this online uh, if you have any more questions about the specifics of the evolution of Hymenoptera, which is the groups that include all wasps, bees, and ants. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Is there more? Oh, yes. Uh, so the question here from Carol to everyone is, uh, how do wasps detect carbon dioxide? Mm -hmm. um, and they uh, detect uh, not just carbon dioxide, but many different types of chemicals in their environment using their antennae. So their antennae is basically what they use to smell. Um, so they are sensitive to carbon dioxide. They're also sensitive to many different types of pheromones that exist out in nature, um, which can lead them to their colony and to their prey. Um, and all sorts of things like that. Um, I think they can also detect water with that. But yeah, I uh, hope that answers your question. If not, I'll leave another one in the message board. Um, you had a question. So I've had an encounter with brown yellow jackets. Yes. And they've been, of course, you know, either dug up by me or something. And 
So those that particular species, do they sting multiple times, or do they <laughs> only once? So the question is, uh, does uh, do ground nesting yellow jackets sting more than once? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, they do. So the follow-up question is: Is the first sting the most potent, and find the successive ones are tiny, or they, <laughs> or do they, do they run out after ten times and you know? So the question was, uh, the, is the first sting always the most painful? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, wasps can uh, control how much venom they inject with every sting. So they can also dry sting if they just want to give you a warning. Um, that doesn't always work on us, but uh, um, so it can be the first, it can be the seventh. Hopefully you're not getting seven of them. <laughs> the, I, I wouldn't want to be the person who found that out. So the hornets now, I'm going to get to hornets. Okay. I've been stung with hornets and they flew off me and I see a sack that looks like it's still pumping on top. Mm. Is that possible? Is that, did they leave something that looks like, or it just happened to break off and it's, we'll see. Okay. So the question is, um, uh, he noticed that there was a, uh, a stinger stuck in him with a venom sack still pumping um, after a sting. And that is actually what happens in bees so that was almost certainly a bee um so with bees they can only sting once because they leave that behind that barbed stinger afterwards um so it's more of a kamikaze vision <laughs> question on the, the social bees ants and wasps are the, mm -hmm. is the caste system is it is in one or the other more stringent for lack of a better term it's kind of like you know is there some variability in like multiple queens or like workers can become something else or is it just kind of like in stone genetically? So the question was, um, between the different groups, bees, social wasps, and ants, um, are there uh, any differences between these different groups in their caste structures? Um, and are they more fluid in some than in others? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So um, the answer is yes, it's it's very complicated. Um, the, uh, the paper wasps, um, have a very fluid caste structure where any female can become a queen if it needs to start laying eggs. Um, so it can just be triggered basically by a wasp puberty <laughs> based on uh, environmental conditions. Um, now the, uh, the yellow jackets and the hornets have a very rigid caste structure, which is determined by from birth. So um, only uh, the larvae that uh, are fertilized can become workers or queens, and only the ones that are unfertilized can become males. Um, and uh, the queens are start queens and end queens. Um, uh, and this is also true in many uh, different bee and wasp or bee and ant lineages. Uh, there is uh, we call it social and eusocial behaviors. And I'm just grouping eusocial into social for most of this presentation. Um, but the eusocial is the really rigid genetically determined caste systems and the social is that and the less rigid yeah, caste yeah. systems yeah great question my last one okay my you're last welcome one. to well ask as many as you want these insects with a large abdomen and very narrow waist mm -hmm. apparently is this true store their sugar or something in their abdomen because so the question is do uh do hymenopterans, bees, ants, and wasps store sugars and fats and stuff in their abdomens? And yes, so a lot of their fat stores is in their abdomen. Most of their fat is actually con uh, concentrated in their thorax because their thorax is attached to the wings and the legs. So they need the most energy right there. Um, the abdomen has the, uh, the reproductive system. It has most of the gastrointestinal system. It has... Um, also uh, functions as a large lung, uh, the whole thing. So uh, basically, if a wasp gets out of breath, which happens, um, you can you might see their uh, abdomen pulsing, um, and that is uh, their abdomen acting like a big lung to pull in air through little uh, holes in the sides uh, to help them oxygenate their tissues. So my follow-up question, have you ever tasted them? Because I was with an entomologist, and he picked out every single ant I could possibly think of, and he could tell them by the flavor <laughs> of ants. 
Uh huh. Cinnamon, little ones with little spicy, and he was just breaking off the end and telling it, you know, and they did have such strong flavor. On that. Interesting. And he was, and so he worked in the Amazons until uh -huh. he ate by the moon because they tasted good. And in the United States, he showed me a stuff in Minnesota, and we were just eating ants, all the red ants, black, and they all had flavor. Uh huh. So I'm wondering if you, someday in the future, if you taste these, that you get the flavor. I have no idea. I so the question was, have I ever eaten or tasted a wasp? Um, and the answer is no, not yet. Um, there are many cultures that do eat them, um, especially indigenous ones in the Americas, uh, because it's a great source of fat and protein if you're not squeamish. Um I, I don't know if the wasps have different flavors uh between one and the other, but I would be curious to find out if somebody else did it first. If you um, can't, you'll notice the first time you do it, sweet, it's flavorful, and you just, <laughs> not even, I, I thought it was not possible it was yogurt, mm -hmm. that he just wanted me to eat. <laughs> yeah, I bet the reason, uh, at least part of the reason that ants have such strong flavors, and this is just conjecture, but um, probably because they their bodies store a lot of formic acid. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be a flavoring yeah. thing. Um, but that's just an idea. I have eaten a lot of other insects, but not those. Um, uh, there is a question online first, and then I'll get to you. Um, so uh, uh, Corin asks, how long does a typical yellow jacket live? Um, so the average is quite a bit lower than their life expectancy, because uh, if they're out foraging, everything loves to eat them. Um, not everything, but everything that can eat wasps loves to eat them. Um, so like songbirds and lizards and all the mammals that I mentioned earlier. So um, they have, uh, many of them do not live to their full potential. Um, the, the maximum that a wasp can live is typically a year. Um, so the queens can live up to a year. Um, and then in the perennial nest, they'll typically be replaced by another uh, of their children. Um, but yeah, so anywhere between uh, a week, if they're unlucky, to a year. Uh, yes. Um, I probably looked this up once, but um, this is a bird question. We have plenty of several bird experts here. Anybody who's had a hummingbird feeder has noticed mm -hmm. they attract wasps. Yes. Sugar. <laughs> and boy, when a hummer's there and the wasp comes in, they, they oh, avoid wow. it. Avoid it. Mm -hmm. can, you know if a single wasp stand can kill a ruby throat hummingbird? I don't, but I'm going to suspect it. I suspect, yeah. Do you have you? Oh, I don't know for certain. The question was, can a single wasp sting kill a hummingbird? And I don't know the answer to this, unfortunately. Um, the hummingbirds do avoid them probably for a reason. Do you have a reading? I, I have not. Yeah. I know there are some tropical species of hummingbirds that uh, love to eat wasps. Uh, yes. So there's at least yeah. there's at least some precedent there for some a conflict, at least. <laughs> I've seen videos of cutting mantis eating hummingbirds. Oh, sure. Yes. Really? Yeah. So, yeah. I didn't uh, I eat hummingbird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll have to look this up. Google. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, the digital collections, and mm -hmm. the digital collections are really important. Can you touch on that? How entomologists use the collections around the world? Sure. Yeah. So the question was, how do I use digital collections, and why are they so important? So digital collections. Uh, to me means uh, museum collections that have been digitized. Is that correct? Yes. That you're looking, okay. Um, so I find them so important because I can't travel to the UK, mm -hmm. for example, on a whim to check out their type specimens of different wasps uh, or insects in general. So I, uh, I really rely on these digitized specimens to be able to tell, okay, what does the species actually look like? And what is the variation? And where is it found? And all of these different pieces of information that is so critical to me doing the job that I do um, as an author. Um, so that's why it's important to me personally. They're also incredibly important to science in general because they are this, this, uh, this relic of a specific time whenever it was collected that tells us so much information about the habitat and about the, uh, the genetics of that wasp at that time, because it does change over time. And it also tells us um, even down to like what the wasp was eating at the time, like we can get an incredible amount of information from these specimens, which is why they, museums are so, so important to the field of entomology. Museums, what are the big museums that would have those? 
So the big museums that have digitized collections that I personally use a lot are the BMNH, which is the British Museum of Natural History. There is the uh, AMNH, which is the American Museum of Natural History. The Smithsonian is starting to get some of their stuff digitized, but they haven't really got a lot of wasps or cicadas yet. Um, there is, let's see. These are like worldwide collections? Um, yeah, these are collections that are collected from all over, um, but are stored in a single museum. I would guess the British probably have the most. They have a lot, certainly. Um, they have a lot of the original type specimens, which are like the specimen that's tied to the original description of that insect, which is important for taxonomic purposes. But um, yeah, there's there's a few, and there's getting to be more, which is really really encouraging. And there's still opportunity to describe and find wasps. Say North America. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like most of the wasp species around here are probably undescribed. Even in New Jersey. Even in New Jersey. Uh, yep. Uh, in researching for my cicada book, I accidentally found 10 new species already. So they're also going to be in the book. Oh. It's it's sort of a running joke among my friends. And I'll just text them at like 2 a.m. and be like, I found another one. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get your name on any of it? Uh, probably not. It's bad taste to uh, name one after yourself. Um <laughs> But, uh, Friends early. <laughs> friend of mine if, asked this question Can wasps be grown on fermented fruit? That is a or, fantastic uh, question. Uh, so, the question is Can wasps get drunk on fermented fruit? And yes, they can. And yes, yeah. they absolutely do. Um, this is a major problem in apple orchards around here, um, where in the fall, when they're starting to get fruit piling up underneath uh, that are starting to rot, a lot of the wasps will be very happy and very drunk. Um, and when they get drunk, sometimes they get quite aggressive too, <laughs> which is just a whole problem. In general, it's I do not advise drinking and flying. <laughs> so just putting that out there. Any other questions? Allie, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, yes. How we'll did hear you. you get interested in wasps? That's a great question. So how did I get interested in wasps? Um, I have always been interested in insects since I was a young girl. Um, I grew up relatively nearby in Hunter County, New Jersey, um, and insects were always the most accessible part of the natural world for me. Mm -hmm. um, and between you and me, I chose wasps at random, um, and I just sort of went with it, uh, and uh, I learned a whole bunch, and now I intend to do that for as many different groups of insects and spiders as I can, so, yeah. <laughs> That's great. The, uh, illustrations, I saw the male and the female had different antennae, or mm -hmm. antennae. Yes, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, so um, the question was, uh, uh, well, I don't actually know if that's a question, but it's it was a comment that the that the male and female wasps uh, have different antennae. Um, the wasp, uh, the males, typically in wasps, the males have longer antennae, so they have more surface area, um, which enables them to seek out females from farther away. Yeah, but great observation. <laughs> Yeah. That's great on uh, morphology type questions. Mm -hmm. I notice in a lot of these pictures, a lot of the abdomens are symmetrical when you look down, but some of them, most, many of them, but on the left side, or, you know, I have either only half a stripe and the other oh, side is clear. Or so is there any advantages there and why they would develop? So uh, actually, that's uh, something that I probably have not made it as clear as I could in the book. Um, so what I've done with a lot of my illustrations is I've split them down the middle to show the full extent of color different variation uh -oh. within one species. Nice. So it's not that they're asymmetrical. It's that I'm trying to cram more information into the smaller space. Um, but great question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> A question about just uh, wasp and decline like all other insects and what can we do to, mm -hmm. for preservation so the question is uh are wasps in decline like most other insects and what can we do about it um yes they are um as with basically all native life uh they are in decline um wasps at least the social ones um are less affected just because they are generalists and they are very good at adapting to new situations they're very intelligent um, so it is not as much a problem with social wasps as it is with many other groups of insects. So like the cicadas I'm working on are affected a lot more 
than these social wasps. But um, yeah, there's a lot of different factors that are contributing to insect decline in general. Um, one is uh, overuse of pesticides. They're, like I said before, there's really not such a thing uh, for general use for homeowners as a wasp specific pesticide or a mosquito specific pesticide. They all affect all of them, um, no matter how they're branded. Um, so overuse of pesticide is really uh, contributing to that. There's also habitat loss. So um, most of habitat loss in this area happened during the colonial times. And then again, during the suburban rush in the 1960s, um, there's not as much habitat loss happening today, but it's still very significant. Um, and it is impacting uh, insect populations. Um, there's also uh, invasive species. Um, so like, uh, I got a question, I think before the presentation about monarchs and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you asked me that. Um, so the, uh, the European paper wasp is actually contributing to monarch decline as well because it's going out and eating all the monarch caterpillars. Um, so it's a whole bunch of different factors. There's invasive species, habitat loss, pesticide use, um, and climate change, which is causing all sorts of chaos. So there's a lot going on. What, what can we do about it is the important thing. Um, more research is very important, especially at this point in time, because we ha still have a little bit of time um, to do this research before these species go extinct. Um, uh, we can also uh, focus on habitat restoration, like what's happening in this area in Great Swamp. Um, that is incredibly important and incredibly effective at preserving native species. Um, you can do invasive species removal. You can uh, plant more native plants, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, you can invest in climate mitigation strategies, not necessarily mine specifically, but like in general, um, we really need to focus on uh, improving the electrical grid to account for more renewable energy. We need to improve our transportation system. There's a whole bunch going on. They're all related to problems, um, but there's a lot we can do. There's a lot anybody can do. So that's what's important. These giant pollinator houses and logs and cedar chips all built into these things contributing, helping, or do they not really use that? Because like the ones we have in the back here. So I don't fully understand what you're talking about. So they sell and build, and we have one in the back that okay. looks like a little tiki house, and it has logs with jewel holes in it, and little compartments where you put cedar chip. Oh, yeah, yeah. Insect hotels, whatever you call it. Yeah, they, they help, I think. Uh, <laughs> I haven't like, looked at the actual studies, um, but uh, drilling into wood is really uh, helpful to, there's a whole bunch of different types of solitary wasps that will build their mud nests in holes in trees. Um, so it's certainly helping them out and giving them a uh, habitat that they can use. So I think that's great. <laughs> okay. Um, Last question, how's the okay. cicada book going? Cicada book is going great. I'm 60% done, should be out next year. Uh, so look forward to it. <laughs> have you eaten any? Have you used them? There's, there's a recipe for them all over. Uh, to be honest, I will not answer that in front of a room of people. Um, <laughs> Good answer. Uh, so we, uh, I think that's all for questions today. Thank you all so much. Um, we, for the people in the room, there are books available for sale. They're $25 a piece and I can sign them. Um, but otherwise, uh, we can feel free to close this out for today. Yeah, thanks very much. This is fascinating. Thank you so much. <laughs>